No. No, what's a quick fix you give up cigarettes? <laughs> yeah, you still struggle <laughs> with that one. Okay. Quick fix. Quick fix. Quick fix. Um what now? Would you have a lot gun? Okay. Are you both still smoking? No. Well, occasionally I have one. I had one yesterday. Yeah. I didn't. I don't think I had one for a few days before that. I can't remember. But mostly just I'm on the lozenges. So. What are those? Yeah, doing. What are they that you're eating? They're no. I've, well, I bought a bowl of Nutrigrain in today because I find in nutrition I always get hungry. <laughs> and when I start thinking about food, <laughs> when I start thinking about food, I can't concentrate. So I thought there's a box of Nutrigrain out there, which we don't get all the time. So I stole a bowl because I don't like it with milk. I just like to eat them. Nice, nice. And keep me focused. Yeah. Um, the the quickest way to give up smoking is to get to a point inside of yourself where you actually want to give up. Because if you're still smoking, yeah, you have to yeah, want it. Yeah, yeah. it means that I you obsess know. over it. Obsess over what, Michael? Giving up, stopping. Like I, I was go the night without a cigarette and go, okay, in the morning, that's it, it's all over. And get up in the morning and, and don't have a coffee and, you know, try and do some exercise and stuff like that. But in the back of my mind, it's all this half a cigarette sitting out there at the ashtray and you know, that I left there the night before or that I've got tobacco in the car or this shop down the road. And, okay. Um, started thinking over giving up. Yeah. Um, I am completely addicted to chocolate, but I don't take it. So what? it's a strategy I learned with my kids when I was raising kids. Um, one of the and you just that is one strategy that you can do, Michael. Because if you're you're obviously addicted, there's there's no doubt about it. Nicotine. Oh yeah, there's no doubt in the world. I've been, <laughs> I've been smoking for two years. And uh, you know you've it's got the first addiction I've ever had. Nicotine <laughs> messes with your neurotransmitters, so it's like it's in there, man. So um, don't even. Oh, <laughs> I know it's in there. It's in there. It's so, it's, it's well and truly ingrained. Uh, <laughs> Is, if you want to talk about it, the, the two things you can do, you have to try and uh, outsmart that thing, and that's not easy, of course. But one of the ways to outsmart it is you just lose it. You have to get rid of all traces of it from your environment yeah. completely. Yeah. Car, there, Absolutely. here, and because you're just fessing up by by saying, mm -hmm. "Well, if I see it, I'm going to take it." That's exactly how I am with chocolate. Oh no, it's not seeing. It's it's this up here. Oh, thinking about it. That's the second part. Yeah, but uh, if you don't get rid of the traces, well, then you're doomed anyway. It doesn't matter whether yeah. you're thinking about it or not. So you've, you've got and it. No bus flying around. No pinches of tobacco. Yeah, me. no, I did that before. So like <laughs> papers and. Yeah, so just put yourself in the category of a child. Like for me, I cannot buy biscuits and chocolate and store it in my cupboard in the kitchen. No way. Because like you just said, Michael, I know it's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, uh, like luckily I don't have enough motivation to go out and buy it if I do get a little bit of a craving or whatever. Um, so anyway, so that's one strategy. You have to do that. Otherwise you just set you're just sabotaging yourself. Um, and then you have to go a little bit more hard line, perhaps too, and that is, and this is more difficult, not to go into an environment where other people are smoking. Um, yeah. Be your friends yeah. or close to you. you. Can't do that either. Not in the initial stages. I'm talking about. You know, you just can't yeah. do that. So you sort of have to. You you sort of have to almost do like a forced lockdown, if I can use that word, because that's what we're using for, for at the moment. Uh, in that capacity. I'm not exactly sure actually how long uh, the nicotine stays in your body, but it's I, you, one of you two may know, but I would suspect that it's at least a month and possibly longer. Do you know? Anyone know? No, it's a lot quicker than that actually. I think it's only a matter of days before it's completely out of your system. Well, but it's... 
it's no when you get past that point, it's no longer which is good to quit in the evening. So you've got all night sleeping. Uh -huh. That gives you a kind of a twelve eight to twelve hour advantage over rather than struggling awake trying to quit. I do you sleep up. Yeah, I can sleep a lot. But um but the nicotine itself, it, it's it, it clears out of the system pretty quickly, like within a matter of like a few days. Yeah. But it's the, it's, and it's not, and the cravings get, they last for less and less as time goes on. Yeah. I mean, I've only found it re sort of easy, but I've got nicotine therapy happening. I've got my nicotine hit still through my lozenges. Right. I, and I, and the reason it's been easy for me is because I know I have so I know I can do it. When you have to, you have to. You don't have a choice. So I know I can do it. Therefore, it's been a little bit easier for me well, to. I, did, I just missed what you just said. Why do you have to do it? What What was that? No, I know. I when I was incarcerated, they took away the cigarettes in jail. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we were issued with um, patches and lozenges. Yeah. So for the twelve months I was in there, you know, with the exception of maybe one banana peel that we dried out and smoked, which was <laughs> the best cigarette I've ever had in my life. <laughs> But with the exception of that, for the I just and so knowing that I could get through a whole year without a cigarette, it's made it kind of easier because I know I can do it. I've done it, you know. Uh, I'm but it is hard to do when there are people smoking. Oh, you know, like, I know Michael. I know Michael wouldn't be hard to twist his want one. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. And so and I that's, that's right. I'm that's trying to go out. I try to do the things associated with smoking, but yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Um, in, in many it's ways, hard. it is in favour of you because the laws have come down pretty hard at prohibiting people from smoking yeah. in public places now. Mm. Um, uh, thanks for that, Anne. That's um, that's insightful. What what I do know My is. Heart. That, there are nicotine receptors in our body and in our brain. So even though, mm. as you just said, it only takes a couple of days perhaps to, to detox from the actual nicotine itself. Yeah, it it's never go away. The readjustments in regards to uh, brain function and neurotransmitters would probably take a little bit longer, uh, which is exactly yeah. the same when you give up a medication or, or yeah. actually another recreational drug. Um, Particularly if they're fat soluble, um, so it takes. So yeah, so you're in that sort of space. So, so that's the first thing I can suggest, uh, Michael, in regards to that. The other thing, and they say this for uh, this is a saying that's used for people who are always broke, actually have no money, or who are in debt a lot. <laughs> and that saying is. Well, if that's your case, you haven't had your sick and tired moment. Um, so what that means is, and this is how I know my father gave up when he was quite young, and this is basically how I gave up when I was in my 20s as well. I certainly wasn't smoking a pack a day, but I was smoking. Uh, I don't even know why, because it was disgusting, but I was. Uh, but one day I got the flu. Uh, the, it looked like a common cold, but it was reasonably severe, and my God, this black stuff came up. By the way, that's why you get sick a lot. Occasionally, it's at random accident because you get infected from someone else. But mostly, it's because your body wants to purify itself. It actually wants to heal itself. So it will force you to be sick. And sick means that you cannot do what you normally do. You normally you're horizontal. You're sleeping a lot. Um, you can't eat the same foods that you eat, and particularly too in this regard, if you've got a serious uh, flu-like lung thing going on, well then you stop smoking. So, and that's exactly what happened to me. I stopped smoking. So I used that, and my God, it was disgusting what came out. You know, normal phlegm comes out as yellow or clear. Well, this was black. And, oh my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my sick and tired moment. So um, if that yeah. happens to you, use it to your advantage. Don't bitch and moan mm. about it, you know. Paul. Yeah, yeah, there was. It's, there's been moments like that. Yeah. Not um, like coughing and stuff, but just, you know, sick and tired of it and stop and then freaking hell a couple of days later, well, smell one and go, oh, I'll just have a try of it to see whether it's still the same. Yeah, right. Um, the other way. <laughs> 
the other aspect of a tired moment is that you you do it this is more difficult but it's definitely possible is that you do it intellectually it's like you just say and sorry to be blunt you just say fuck it that's it that's you know so you draw a line in the sand basically um mm. so uh and like i said that's not easy and it requires that's using basically will your will and intellect so you have to then create but not from an ego point of view uh certainly mm. not mm. and th this sort of applies to any sort of serious addiction that's that's that yeah this is another strategy for addictions as well um and that is just to draw a line in the sand and make it clear that you're very aware of your own vulnerabilities and susceptibilities. You have to be. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, you're using your intellect and your will to make it very clear to yourself that you are not going to negotiate with that substance. And um, mm. so it's a more hard line approach uh, at the moment. Uh, if you're still uh, susceptible to it, well, in some ways you're still negotiating with it and you're still playing around. Um, and that's obvious. That's just what yeah. happens. And that's when you're all sin. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, I mean, if I was in Michael's position, I would just be like, I'm not ready. I'm going to smoke until I get yeah, to a point a where, point. you know what I mean? Because it's the same with drugs. Like, when I came in here and I had drugs and I knew if I didn't give them to somebody, mm. absolutely I was going to use them. So, yeah. Yeah. but I knew I made the decision before I walked in the door that as soon as I walk in the door, that's it. And there's no more drugs. So anytime I find an old sappy bag or anything that's even drug related, I give it straight to staff. I try not to hide, I don't hold on to it. I just, I try to get rid of it straight away yeah. because I'm not a drug user anymore. So, Good. and I think you've got that battle going on. Well, if I was here every day battling staying here and not using drugs, then I wouldn't stay. I'd just go out and use drugs again because I'm not ready. So, um, yeah, so you have to be ready to some degree. But the other thing you got going mm. against you, and this applies to both you, but also Michael, is that you have a habit. Uh, and I don't mean the habit of smoking. I mean the habit that is associated with the act of smoking. Oh, yeah. That is your habit. Um, so you have to, not have to, but one of the, another strategy is that you have to replace that habit with something else. And I'm not talking about the actual habit of smoking. I'm talking about what you get out of it. Yeah. So you get yeah. something yeah. out of it. That's obvious. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. So what, how, what, yeah, what, it's, it's an avoiding strategy. What's that? What did you say? It's an avoidance strategy. Um, it, well, you could look for at me. It. It's an avoidance strategy because I, when I'm bored, I smoke, and then when I think that okay, I'm going to replace that smoke. When I feel like a smoke, I'm going to go and do some exercise or sit ups or whatever I need to do. That just goes out the window, and that thought of oh, fuck, have a smoke first, or have a puff of smoke, and then do that. It's like procrastinate. It's just procrastinating. That's right. That's right. So that that's a habit, by the way. Procrastinating is a habit. I'm well aware of that. I was an expert in that when I was a teenager. Um, yeah, I'm still I'm an expert. expert. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, still, I'm still accused of it every now and then. But so you need to create a new habit. Don't don't well, don't procrastinate. But it's easy enough for me to say don't procrastinate. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. You have to replace. <laughs> Uh, right. You have to develop what we call a sense of self-efficacy. So it's easy for me to say don't procrastinate. But for you to, to do that, you have to replace that with a feeling that's better for you mm. than procrastinating. You have to replace the act yeah. of putting a cigarette in your mouth and puffing in and getting some enjoyment out of it with another act that you will actually enjoy eventually even more than sucking it in. Um, I used to have uh, yeah. a, fr a friend of mine who was who used to teach meditation. This was like 20 years ago. And he had a theory, his theory of why people smoked. 
this may be controversial, but his theory of why people smoked was that they're trying to become aware of their breath. They have no, they've never heard about oh, sorry, sorry. Breath. of their breath. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I know. That was his theory. And uh, and I, I found it really interesting. And of course, both of you, and if you're doing, if you've been introduced to the concept and the practice of meditation, well, then you're already on that page. But um, you know what? Um, so uh, these days, when I found find myself in a pickle, and I don't have any cravings for smoking at all, um, I actually, uh, if I can remember, actually just step back and just remember that I'm breathing, that I'm actually alive. Um, and that happens, and I don't close my eyes necessarily. I, it's just a practice that I've developed. So one thing I could suggest, Michael, is that you one habit that you can get into when you actually just try it, just try it today. When you feel a craving for a cigarette, in that moment, uh, if, you, if you're open to the idea that you actually may just want to, <laughs> to connect with a, a really wholesome peaceful feeling inside of yourself well just instead of putting the cigarette in your mouth start applying what we do in the in the meditation while you're awake mm -hmm. while you're sitting there while you're talking to someone um, it's an interesting thing and uh, and I found that so interesting I saw a little interview of a Buddhist monk yesterday um, and the he's about he's quite old now um, and basically they were asking him, well, what does he do? And he actually does things like that. He uh, actually tries, and I'm not suggesting that we become monks, um, but it did occur to me, though, that if you're going to become a monk, this is a good time to do it. If you're in the level of <laughs> lockdown <laughs> that, that we are in, I don't think we're far away from it. Um, so anyway, just a suggestion. Uh, to to you know just replacing some some habits that uh, uh, you know may not be that good for you. So I wonder if I might just be able to point something out as well. And because yesterday in group we were talking about the shadow self and all that, but I have noticed Michael, and I say this with complete love and compassion, that when he's struggling with the smoking thing there's so much negative self-talk going on like he's really beating himself up about the fact that he hasn't quit mm. and you just it's i think it's really important that you give yourself a break i mean oh yeah because i don't i mean i don't know your whole history but the history that you've told me a little bit of i mean he's overcome huge mountains and obstacles and he's still sitting here with both his legs and he's okay you know so as smoke as much as the smoking isn't necessarily a good choice to be making every day it's certainly better than the choices he's made in the past so you know i think it's important that he focuses on the the glass being half full rather than a half empty oh know. yeah i had been and that's but but that's what's kept me smoking yeah i know that's what's kept me smoking but you know it's you know mm. it doesn't but you shouldn't beat yourself up about it like give yourself a hard time about it you need to be more compassionate with yourself yeah, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know I do. I know I do, and that's makes it hard when I say, "Fuck, why can't you know?" I stop smoking when I can give up heroin and cocaine and all the other shit. But anyway, um, what I was going to say, Hart, is like I have a little routine that I do of the morning with meditation, like exercise, get up, do a daily reading. And do some exercise and then do some meditation or go for a push bike ride and do some meditation. And this morning when I was struggling and wanting a cigarette, I thought, okay, I'm going to change it around. I'm going to stop exercising. I'm going to go into the room where when it's raining, like I go into a lounge room here and sit down and do the meditation. And this morning I just, I just couldn't focus. You know, I had the had my earplugs in. And I was listening, and my legs were on, but I just felt like moving, like I was in a rush. Yeah. And the rush was that you know to go and have a cigarette. But after, like you're saying, down 
rolled a cigarette and thought about it and thought, oh, what are you doing? You know, you don't need to do this. There's other options. And like, this is after many battles of have, will I have one? Why don't I have one? I don't need one. I do need one. I don't want one. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, after I had it, I thought to myself, okay, it's only one cigarette. It's not that bad. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, but but that, that, that allows me to think that, well, it's only one cigarette. So an hour later, oh, it's only another cigarette. And this is what's happened for the last 40 years. Yeah. So, um, in, I'll give up tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, in part, you're still... That, that question, the question of... Um, Go ahead. Yep. The question is asked, are you, you know, it's been asked me a couple of times by different people. Yeah. Well, this smoking is, are you unmanageable when you smoke? And, you know, I can, finances and that okay. And I can manage the finances, it's expensive, but I can make do. Mm. And, um, you know, the thing is, it's, it's trying to get fit and breathe and do all that kind of stuff without being puffed out. That's where it becomes unmanageable. Mm. So, yeah. But generally, if I'm smoking and not thinking about giving up, I can go to group and I can do a class and not think about it, not worry about it, because I know that when I walk out, you know, whether I have one then or delay it and have one after lunch or whatever, yeah, it's um. It, it's yeah, the, it doesn't worry me. But when I start, yeah, it it's constantly there. It's that little voice. Like um, I completely gave up drinking three years ago, and again I had um a sick and tired. I wasn't drinking excessively, but I was drinking consistently. Um, and around that time, uh, that's when I started my degree, and I started actually. I had some. I've always had liver uh, issues. And they sort of came up quite a bit. So I started to feel almost nauseous whenever I'd, I'd even have a few sips of, of, of some alcohol. So there, there was a whole confluence of factors. But around that time, I, was, I, be, I started to become acutely aware of exactly what you're describing there, Michael. And that's that little voice. There's a little voice that, you, uh, that I was negotiating with constantly. And I sort of kept it there. It's sort of like a bad friend <laughs> that that is going to always lead you astray. It's like it's a good friend because yeah. the person he or she listens to you and you know pats you on the back and saying it's okay, don't worry about it. So it's a it's yeah. a good friend like that. But uh, yeah. but the friend is always wanting you to have another drink. To have a smoke, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, look, just relax. It's okay. It's only just one. So the thing is, it's not so. You you'll never change that friend, ever, never. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh, uh, they don't even think that that's possible. You can't negotiate with that friend. Well, the actual fact is, you are negotiating mm -hmm. with that friend by keeping that friend around. Um, and in some ways, you're negotiating with yourself there because you know that you don't really want to give that friend the flick and never see that friend again because there's there's something there's something that you're getting out of that. But look, that's why I was trying to say another way of saying is what I was saying before. You just have to use an act of will. If someone or something is bad for you, and you and if you've reached that point where you realise that you are powerless in your negotiating capabilities with that friend, well, then you have to leave, you have to give it away. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what you did too, Anne. When you, yeah. when you, that's exactly what you described uh, in reality, mm. the friend that you had. So it's, it's an interesting friend. It's not necessarily a friend on the outside, but it's a friend on the inside. And I'm, say, I'm using the word friend because you up until now, you keep talking to it, to him, her, whatever it is. <laughs> um, oh my god! Um, so, it's all right. It's fine. I know you're struggling with. 
that, that's it. what happened to me. And then I realized that little voice was always there. Luckily for me, uh, I had, like I said, that confluence of factors. I actually got physically not well. And also mm. uh, after a, a month or so of starting my course, I realized I couldn't do it. I, I was either, mm. there's no way I could carry on and do a fairly significant endeavor that I'd chosen to do. And that's another thing, Michael, sometimes you uh, put something, you actually preoccupy yourself. I didn't do it for that reason, but that's legitimate as well. Meaning that say you embark on a, a fairly ambitious uh, exercise regime where say, I'm not telling you to do this, I'm just suggesting this is another thing. Say you want to get to the point where you can run 10K uh, in a in a in a uh, you know a walk fast uh, in a reasonable amount of time, well, that you're replacing. You can't. You the two are mutually exclusive. You won't be able to do the two at the yeah. same. Time. That's what yeah. I'm going to say. Well, that's or even if you get a job, you know, uh, uh, or something where you have to be, you know, quite physically exert yourself. The other thing. Uh, so luckily for me, but I have to be real. I got to tell you something uh, as well. I don't know. Your, your Excuse me. That's all right. Sorry. Um, I I don't know your history. Maybe you can mention this to Michael um, later on. And that the longer you doing something, the uh, easier it gets. Well, no. Well, that's right. If you're doing a good thing. But if you've been smoking or drinking or whatever since you were uh, 16, well, that's a that's a, a bigger hurdle that you have to overcome, All right? Certainly yeah. not, not yeah. possible. Certainly possible. But again, I'm sort of putting it in there. Don't underestimate the forces that are against you, because you've got better chances of coming out the other end if you know what you're dealing with. Because as yeah. you so clearly articulated, it's tiring to keep failing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's actually not good either. Yeah. Because it erodes your not. confidence, it erodes your self-esteem. So you've got to be able to make some, you've got to have a realistic appraisal of what you're dealing with and then set up a plan and a strategy to move forward. Yeah. Yeah, that's really yeah. important. Um, so... Um, Maybe if you could just mention that to Michael when when you see him. Um, sure. I'm assuming he's talking about it because he wants some help. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't be talking about it. I can see he struggles with it. Yeah. I can see that he's struggling with it. Because on the one hand, he really wants to quit. And on the other hand, yeah. but he, you know, when, when you leave, I think when you when you leave the door ajar and you have, have it, you know, like, when you, you kind of set yourself up to fail a little bit when you leave yourself a little bit of room for failing. <laughs> right, that's right. You know, <laughs> like, that's right. That's you know exactly what I'm, right. Yeah. You're getting into this grey area where you just keep negotiating with, as we've clearly just been talking yeah. about. Um, another way that I usually yeah. avoid is the, the carrot and stick approach, meaning that, uh, mm. you know, and that's what obviously, and that has that works for people. Meaning that you learn mm. how what how cigarette smoking, what it's actually doing to you. You know, um, what are the yeah. what is it actually doing? So if you're going to play the game, and it's a game where you're negotiating mm. with yourself, should I give them you, and then beating yourself up because that's all part of the game, right? Mm. It's true. Yes. It's like you're yeah. playing the game with yourself and uh, the whole, you know, victim thing then and beating yourself up and poor me and, oh, I wish I could do it. That's all part of the game. So another yeah. strategy would be to completely familiarise yourself with the nasty aspect, the physiological aspect of smoking. Yeah. And then make yeah. a conscious decision, as you were saying before, after you've mm. completely immersed yourself in the dark side of smoking, like find out yeah. what is really going on here, uh, which is what they yeah. try to do superficially by putting those pack, those pictures of people with lung things on the back of the packets and all that sort of stuff. That's what they're trying to do. But even that, mm. after a while, you mm. get desensitized to that and you just ignore yeah. them. Um, so yeah. 
if you if you're going to do something you know may not be good for you and yeah you want to do it consciously and not keep playing that game with yourself and negotiating yeah well then go into it deeply and then make a conscious decision okay yeah i'm uh, there's a high probability i'm going to get cancer from this i'm not going to see my kids and i'm not going to be able to do this i'm not going to, be able to do this exercise blah 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 um and that blah 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 has to be real for you you have to go into that dark side yeah you know um and yeah and an interesting thing too with michael because he's interested in the psyche he missed a couple of the classes there where we were talking about that because yeah. Um, there's also that aspect as well that you're yeah. you need to be quite clear about and confront yourself. Not so much confront yeah. yourself, but at least you know when you're in that grip, you need to be quite clear of what's actually going on there with inside of yourself. And it's an aspect of not yeah. yourself. Um, I was just I was just thinking, you know, that when I like because I'm not struggling with um, addiction to substances right at this moment. So um, I, my focus though, I I struggle with the letting go of people that aren't good for me. Like so, my last relationship, and I've noticed that a good thing for me to do. I don't know about anybody else, but when I'm really feeling the wanting to text them or unblock them and and just you know because I have moments where I forget all the bad stuff and I just focus on all the lovely stuff. And I, then I, I, I've been trying to then look at why am I feeling the need to reach out to somebody who's toxic for me? And I, so I try to write down what am I feeling at the moment? And most of the time I'm lonely or I just want to lay down and cuddle someone. It's not that I necessarily want to go full blown into that relationship again, but it's because of how I'm feeling. It's and they, and, you know, it's a very temporary. Whenever I do that, if I was to pick up the phone and text, I immediately feel like shit. I, you know, I shouldn't have done that. That's not good for me, you know. And and then I and I can get into the mindset of, damn it, I'm back to square one again, you know. So now instead of picking up the phone, I try to pick up a pen and just write honestly because no one else is going to read it. So it doesn't matter what I write. Yeah. I just try to be really completely honest and. And, and I mean, that sort of involves being a little bit vulnerable, like, and it's not comfortable, you know, Absolutely. that I try to write down what it is that I'm feeling that's making me want to pick up the phone and reach out for something that's going to make me feel better. Well, you know, I convince myself it's going to make me feel better. But in reality, I know in the long term, it's not going to make me feel better. Yeah. So I try to write down what am I feeling? And I try to touch in with what's going on inside of me and and it's really simple stuff a lot of the time it's just that I'm really I don't want to um, sit with myself I want you know I'd rather be focusing on somebody else and, right. and I want I want to feel loved you know right. so you know and and then they're all just I think they're just all pretty basic human desires really hmm. but I'm, I'm trying not to get into the the toxic field of you know reaching out to the wrong people and yeah um, you know it doesn't uh, fix when, me it when, just, you crack, it when you crack that code please let me know uh, because no I will no <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> uh, it, you're right it's there's some inherent humanness in there absolutely yeah. but you know yeah. um, and I can completely relate to what you're saying. And it doesn't, yeah. it's not a matter of how old you are and sometimes how wise you are, that that all mm. doesn't come and bother you. You know, the loneliness is a, is a, is something that's in, I think is inherently in our humanness. It's inherently human and not yeah. to replace it with something else, but it's the no. more you can, and this is really what, <laughs> even, at, you know, at my age, this is what I'm still working with you know an aspect yeah. of self you know that talk we heard the other day like victory over the self when prem Rao yeah. was talking it's an interesting thing and uh when that that's quite profound if you really start trying to think about it well what are all these forces that are coming up within us that in many ways and as you were just saying 
lead us into areas where almost instantly, as soon as we step a foot towards that direction, we realize, whoops, <laughs> this may yeah. not actually be good for me. So it's a yeah. very interesting thing. And as far as I can tell, all we've got initially, because you can't beat yourself up, you can't tell you not no. to tell yourself necessarily no. not to feel lonely. You can't, it doesn't yeah. matter how much in positive self talk sometimes that you give yourself. There are these things inside yeah. of us that keep bubbling up or can bubble up. So yeah. the only thing we've got initially is just to be conscious of it and try to fill in some of the spaces more around it, which is exactly what you're doing when you're describing it. Like, And one yeah. other extension to what you just described, and then maybe we can leave that for today, is that if you, in that space where you're consumed with loneliness and trying to reach and wanting to reach out to someone, an interesting thing that happens there is that you actually have virtually zero awareness of the other person. It's all yeah. about you. Yeah, it is. Consumed in that. And I've just recently started to even become aware of that. And then yeah. the interesting thing is that if you can start exerting a little bit of brain power and consciousness into the extending it beyond yourself and well and asking, well, you know this person's history. You know what they're like. You know what they're capable of. Um well, are they in any position at all to actually help you long term for your highest good? <laughs> really? No. <laughs> so, yeah, no. You know, uh, it's a high expectation to put on other people. Yeah, I know. And, and in some ways, that's exactly right. If we, you know, yeah. if we're trying to, if we just need our space filled in that moment and text someone else, what we're doing, yeah. not just causing ourselves a disservice, but you're actually causing a disservice to the other person as well. Because, they, 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 you know, it's highly possible that, you know, unless it's someone that you know and trust and, you know, has helped you in the past, uh, that they, they, they're consumed with their own problems. <laughs> you yeah. Know, and uh, yeah. struggling just as well. So, you know, yeah. we don't want to get into a situation of the blind leading the blind. Right. So it is an opportunity Though, if you look at it, one other way of looking at it too, that because I can completely relate, is an opportunity to be able to get to know yourself even more. Yeah. In that. Yeah. So what what is it? So I'm not going to, you know, talk about details yeah. of that. And uh, but we have to keep trying to connect with something that enables us to stand on our own two feet. Um, yeah. And I'm not exempt. I'm not here preaching from some point where I've mastered all of that. But one thing I no. have become clear of that if we want to make a positive impact in our own life and then reach out to other people around it, we, in some ways we need to be able to be resilient and be able to stand on our own two feet and draw Absolutely. upon the deeper resources that are available within us. That yeah. has become very clear to me in my life. Um, and sometimes it's more of a challenge than others, but let's, yeah. let's have a go. You okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs>